The 6 o'clock news starts right now. A few lingering showers still hanging around as we head into the evening hours. Adam Kasky keeping an eye on the radar. We'll check in with him to find out how the rain chances are looking heading into the holiday weekend in just a few minutes. The first COVID-19 vaccines arrived in San Antonio six and a half months ago. Now local officials are pushing for the remaining unvaccinated people to come and get their doses. Our Garrett Berger tells us how that's going and the latest effort to sway those still uncertain. Life's been getting closer to normal in San Antonio, but the mayor says the Alamo City isn't off the hook and it's still important to get vaccinated. Do it for you. Do it for your loved ones. Do it for San Antonio. The initial scramble for doses is over, and almost 73% of Bear County residents 12 and up are at least partially vaccinated now. Visits to mass vaccination clinics have dropped off, though. An assistant city manager, Colleen Bridger, acknowledged that pop-up clinics held around the city to provide easier access have had relatively low turnout. Ones held at Fiesta events average fewer than eight patients per clinic. With all things COVID, we got to try it and see if it works. If it doesn't, we'll pivot. We'll try something else. Bridger says that through the pandemic, people 20 to 40 seem to have both the highest level of infections and the lowest level of vaccinations. While Bridger says there are some people who won't ever go for the vaccine, she thinks others may have just been busy. I'm trying to speak to the undecided group and say, if you haven't prioritized it yet, please do. To sweeten the deal, the Top city secret. announced today it had teamed up Thank with the Spurs you, for a pair of clinics next month wow, at which they'll raffle off Spurs so the tickets. Spurs the latest tactic to, to throw against the wall and see what sticks. And if y'all hear of anything else we can do, let me know. Garrett Berger, KSAT 12 News. San Antonio police investigating a pair of deadly shootings, the first at a motel on the city's northeast side, which happened early this morning. Officers were called to the Days Inn at I-35 and Whirlwind Street around 5.30 a.m. When they got there, they found the 33-year-old victim in the parking lot next to a pickup truck. Officers say they're questioning a 19 year old man who they say shot the other man. We're told this is related to a domestic violence situation, but police did not elaborate on the relationship between these two men. Neither man has been identified. So far, no word of any charges. SAPD also searching for at least two suspects in connection with a deadly shooting at an apartment complex over on the city's north side. It happened a little before 730 in the 8400 block of Country Village near Loop 410 and Broadway. Officers found the victim in a breezeway there. Investigators believe the unidentified man was targeted. People living in the complex told police they heard half a dozen gunshots this morning and had heard shots fired three nights in a row. Police did not say if those shots were linked. Witnesses say they saw a vehicle leaving the scene with a couple of people in it, but no description was given. Months after a deadly shooting in Poteet, <coughs> Atascosa County deputies say the suspect has turned himself in. 63-year-old Jimmy Garza was indicted by a grand jury this month. He was wanted in connection with a deadly shooting near Highway 16 in Poteet. Deputies say back in February, he shot and killed Brad Rumfeld at BR Outfitters taxidermy shop. Details about what happened that led up to that shooting have not been revealed. Bond has been set at $100,000. San Antonio police need your help tracking down a man they say ripped off a restaurant over on the city's north side. Investigators say this man walked into the wing stop near Highway 281 in Evans Road last week, went up to the counter and demanded cash. Then he ran off. Information that leads to an arrest in this case could be worth up to $5,000 from Crime Stoppers. Just call 210-224-STOP with your tips. It is an effort the Biden administration suspended, building a wall along the border with Mexico, as promised by former President Donald Trump. But that effort resurrected here in Texas by Governor Greg Abbott, who, along with Trump today, visited the South Texas border to talk border security and work on the wall resuming. Our Jonathan Cotto at the border covering the former president's visit. Both Governor Greg Abbott and former President Donald Trump had different talking points during today's event. Governor Abbott talked about the need to secure the border while President Trump brought up his belief that the presidential election was stolen. However, the two did lash out at President Joe Biden saying the administration is not doing enough to secure the border. All Biden had to do is go to the beach. If he would have just done nothing, 
We would have now the strongest border we've ever had. It was even getting better and better and better because it was all kicking in. The former president claimed that he had the situation at the border, quote, under control and added that had he won the re-election, the wall would have been finished in two months, despite being hundreds of miles short of his original goal. Everything could have been completed. It would have been painted, not sitting there rotting and rusting. It would have been perfecto. It was all set. The contractors were great. Construction of the border wall that you see behind me that runs through the middle of an RV park halted. Governor Abbott encouraging private donations to be able to complete this project. And he says the project is well underway. Reporting live from the Rio Grande Valley, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jonathan. And while Governor Abbott and former President Donald Trump were speaking at the border today, Democrat leaders of Texas spoke at the state capitol building in Austin. They called the governor's trip to the border a political stunt and said the primary concern of state officials should be fixing the state's power grid. The event was part of an ongoing campaign to fix the grid and included speeches from Lieutenant Governor candidate Mike Collier. Coming up in our KSAT Q&A, we'll talk about whether the power grid is likely to come up during this special session, which starts in a few days. New at six, from the Eastside Boys and Girls Club all the way to the Olympics, a San Antonio boxing coach is fulfilling his dreams while keeping San Antonio in his heart. Courtney Friedman speaks to former amateur boxer Jeffrey Mays, who leaves for Japan tomorrow as a coach for the Olympic team. Jeffrey Mays was a name once well known in the amateur boxing world. Then he joined the Army for 21 years with two deployments to Iraq. He retired in 2014, taking his talents to a place he felt they were most needed, the Boys and Girls Club on San Antonio's east side. I wanted to try to do my part to try to give back and try to you know, help the kids in that, on that side of town. I'm still in touch with just about every one of them. They were his biggest fans while he began coaching Team USA in 2017. And now he's about to serve his country in yet another uniform as he heads to the Tokyo Olympics as one of four accredited boxing coaches. They made it official last month. It felt truly amazing. Have you been to the Olympics before? No, I wanted to go as a boxer, but I had an injury and had to postpone those dreams. And now it's just Full circle, he came back around. I'm mean, now going as a coach. He's been in Colorado Springs at training camp since June 1st, and today he'll be leaving for Japan. Olympic boxing starts on July 23rd, and Team USA's first member will compete on the 24th. It's the experience of a lifetime. This is what every amateur coach and boxer dreams of going to the Olympics. We're trying to put San Antonio on the map. Representing the 210 while sending a message back to his East Side family. Hard work, dedication, and belief. Anything is possible. Courtney Friedman, Case at 12. Of news. Fiesta 2021 might have ended last weekend, but the official metal weigh-in is wrapping up right now. The annual weigh-in started earlier this afternoon at Monarch Trophy Studios. Collectors from all over the city came to show off their best finds and see how many medals they ended up scoring. Now, because of the pandemic, they could bring in any medals from 2020 and 2021. The last time we did this was in 2019. And I believe the person that won had like, I don't know, 700 medals and 45 pounds. And this year's winner is Blue Rose Alvarez with a weigh in of 35.14 pounds. That is 454 medals. That's a lot of medals. <laughs> <laughs> it is, but it doesn't surprise me in the least. Congrats. Taking a live look outside, a beautiful shot of downtown San Antonio with the clouds behind it. More rain showers, cooler temperatures, all things we like this time of year. Yeah, some rain making clouds off in the distance there. And you look at the airport today in town, we picked up a hundredth of an inch of rain with a high temperature of 91 degrees, which is two degrees below average. But you look at the rainfall since Sunday across South Texas and Central Texas and good coverage out there, not as much closer to the Rio Grande. Uh, Pipe Creek, nearly three inches of rainfall. As usual, it's streaky and it's a case of the haves and the have nots. I mean, Smiley over three inches since Sunday. Nearby Nixon, about 15 hundredths of an inch. Okay, Th these are actual rain gauge measurements. Stinson 1.33, Poteet just over half an inch. Still some spotty activity out there and you see some thunderstorms off in northern Kendall County right now. A little bit of lightning and thunder associated with those. Temperature-wise, some rain cool there.
77 degrees will spring 77 in New Braunfels. We're going to talk more about this rainy weather pattern if it's going to last for the rest of the week and even the 4th of July holiday. Those rain chances coming up. Thank you, Adam. If you have some ideas on how to improve Bandera Road, TechStot wants to hear from you. How you can share your ideas and a couple that are already on the table next at 6. TechStot wants to know what the public thinks should be done to improve Bandera Road between the loops build a new one. The roadway is one of the most congested in the region with traffic expected to nearly double in the coming decades. Samuel King joins us now with options planners are considering. Well, Tim and Myra, as you well know, Bandera Road between Loop 410 and Loop 1604 is a complex corridor and presents a lot of challenges, to say the least. One thing TxDOT has already heard a lot from people is doing something about the amount of traffic signals and intersections along the roadway. I mean, sometimes when I'm in a rush, I, I feel like I'm hitting every red light, so. And she's not the only driver frustrated. Maybe another lane, uh, something changing the signals a little more, a little less sporadic, so where I'm not getting through one light and then immediately getting caught by the next. TechStat says that even before the virtual public hearing launching this week, it heard from drivers who feel the signals on Bandera Road are not synced up. But they actually are. There's just too much traffic. Of the 17 signalized intersections between I-410 and Loop 1604, eight are at or over capacity in the existing condition. This leads to delays and backups, which in turn creates variable travel times and speeds during peak periods. So how do you get traffic flowing better in the area? TxDOT is exploring a number of options. One, reducing the number of intersections with roads that don't have as many cars and redesigning other intersections to perhaps add overpasses or underpasses, like on parts of Medical Drive or Wurzbach Parkway. The plans are still in the early stages. Drivers are glad that relief is being talked about at least. Just anything that's going to help the flow of traffic is going to be better. I know people get up, they got to get to work in the morning, so anything that's going to make it more convenient for the public. TechSot also exploring more shared use paths instead of relying only on new sidewalks and bike lanes. It's also in, consult in consultation with VIA, the city of Leon Valley, and the city of San Antonio, which is doing its own corridor study. You have until July 14th to submit comments to TechSot. The presentation is available on the TechSot website. We'll have a link on our website, ksat.com. As for traffic in that area, this is a look at 1604 at Bandera Road. As we head over here to the uh, big wall, so you can see a traffic building a little bit there on 1604 as people head down on Bandera Road this evening. And here's a look at uh, travel times here. 13 minutes heading northbound from 410, 12 minutes heading southbound. That's okay. And usually this corridor here between Gilbert in Hebner, one of the corridors look, being looked at by TxDOT as we look at this thing here. Also, some delays on Loop 410 between 281 and I-10, four uh, 14 uh, minutes heading westbound there as your travel time, uh, traffic speed down to 19 miles per hour, 66 miles per hour going the other way. So you can see the idea of the delay heading eastbound there on I-10. Also watching some things on the northeast side as well, perhaps or actually north, north of the northeast side, a bit of six mile delay, had some stalled vehicles, also that construction here in Comal County on I-35, always something to keep in mind especially this time of day. I'm taking a look again at Transguide. Wanted to show you this before I toss it back to everybody. This is I-10 coming into uh, downtown and heading out of downtown. Excuse me there. You can see a backup there. So something to look out for here, especially if you're heading downtown. Our normal trouble spots seem to have a lot of it. People not heading out for their holiday weekend just yet, Tim and Meyer. Much better to be stuck here inside than stuck out there in that. <laughs> that is correct. <laughs> All right, so outside today, speaking of which, still pretty nice for this time of year. I mean, can we call it cool? I think we can. For, <laughs> I think so. For late June. Yeah. It's all relative, isn't it? You, you <laughs> call it what you want. I, that, Let us call it pretty cool. Whatever you I want mean, to call it. How often do we get to say that? Exactly. It doesn't bother me. <laughs> whatever you want to call it, whatever kind of adjective you want to give it. Let's take a look at the radar. We're going to start off with that and get right to it. We have some lingering down 
downpours out there, not as numerous as they were earlier today, as we typically see this activity start to fade away once that sun gets lower and we lose our daytime heating. And so that's the case again today. Same old routine all over again. So what we have out there right now is really the last of the activity that we're expecting for the day and even into the night. But you head east of town, Lavaca County getting some heavy downpour. Schulenburg now approaching Moulton just north of Hallettsville as well. And this is the I-10 corridor. You head closer to San Antonio. Our activity has already come and gone. And that little bit north of New Braunfels has since dissipated right along I-35 between New Braunfels and San Marcos. You see these are fairly brief downpours. Some of them have a little bit of lightning, at least briefly, especially south of Fredericksburg right now. But by and large, these have a little to no lightning, are very brief and just confined to the evening hours. And this is going to be the case again, even as we go into the 4th of July. So as you plan your 4th of July and if you have any outdoor activities planned, just know that you may have to dodge a shower or two, but we're not expecting anything severe. It's not going to rain all day. And for the most part, it's just quick, brief splash and dash showers. Look at the radar through the day today. Here we go. Splash dash dissipate. That's what's going on out there. I do think this pattern is going to quiet down a bit for the next couple of days because we've got a little upper level ridge that's over Dallas, not a very strong one, but once it centers itself over us for two days, our rain chances go down to about 10% for Thursday and Friday. So generally dry the next couple of days, consequently a little bit warmer back in the low to mid nineties. Then we fall back into this pattern again for Saturday through 4th of July and all the way into the early part of next week. Main points to remember when planning your 4th of July. These are just brief downpours, minimal lightning. Some of them don't even have lightning. So if you've, you're swimming in the pool, you can actually swim in the rain for some of these. And if, if you don't hear thunder, you don't have lightning. They're not severe and they end around sunset, so fireworks should be okay. Let's talk about the tropics. We've got a new system that's brewing out there. This is way out in the Atlantic Ocean right now. It's called Potential Tropical Cyclone 5. It's basically a, I know, it's basically a tropical depression. And should this become a tropical storm, which it's likely to do in the next day or so, this would become Elsa. Yes, cue the internet memes right now. This would be Elsa. And the, pa the track would take it. Hold on, this is going to load. Sometimes these get so full of information. There we go. that They take a second to animate. But I mean, we're looking at tropical storm strength is what we're expecting all the way into Monday of next week, somewhere near Cuba or South Florida. Okay, right now expected to remain tropical storm strength once it gets there. And yes, Elsa, we're going to see it all over social media, folks. Oh, 83 degrees, the temperature right now, dew point is 73, so it feels like 89. A mixture of clouds and sun out there. Castroville's 87. Meanwhile, Canyon Lake, 79. A little outflow boundary there, some rain cool there affecting them. Same with New Braunfels, 78. Stinson, meanwhile, 85 degrees. Carrizo Springs, 77. Good to see some rain in and around Carrizo Springs. So tomorrow morning, Low to mid 70s to start the day. We'll be 71 in Kerrville, 73 Canyon Lake, and 75 in Catula. By the afternoon, we roll back into the low to mid 90s. So Hondo, 90 degrees. We'll be about 91 in Holotus, 90 Timberwood Park, and 92 in Elmendorf. And really, tomorrow, a decent amount of sunshine. And this is going to be the case the next couple of days. Generally dry and sunny, better for the for working outdoors in the afternoons, you don't have to dodge as many showers, but then we get back into the daily pop up downpour routine this weekend. You seem excited about that uh, <laughs> coverage there. Well, of course, they had Anna earlier in the season. Now we have Elsa. Here we go. Uh, okay. Let it go. Well, we'll, Let it we'll go. wait on the puns until she's uh -huh. officially named. We'll just wait till Spreester gets back. Oh, <laughs> oh, boy. <geez. laughs> I'll let it when, all when is he coming rest back? on him. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Adam. All right, Larry, uh, Dak Prescott keeping it close to the vest when it comes to his vaccination status. Yeah, he's one of uh, many athletes out there that they don't want to say whether or not yeah. they had the COVID-19 vaccination, but Dak is one of the bigger name athletes to recently come out and say this. It is mums the word on the COVID-19 vaccination, and he has his reasons why we got him for you. Plus, we are going to check in with Canyon Cougars quarterback Drew Barry coming up.
think it's very important, especially getting guys out here to throw with, building chemistry back up. Got a bunch of new receivers. We're going to make a big stamp on the season and get back into it, feel good again. Near Brown Falls Canyon, Cougars quarterback Drew Barry says offseason workouts are very important in big board sports. Pro football coverage, powered by Davis Law Firm. With training camp right around the corner, Cowboys quarterback Dak Prescott won't reveal if he's had the COVID-19 vaccine shot, telling NBC5 Dallas Fort Worth that he doesn't want to sway anyone either way. He said for him, it's important for everybody to educate themselves on what's best. The NFL has not mandated the vaccine, but the league and the NFL Players Association are receiving backlash from players after releasing the updated guidelines for vaccinated players this month. The policy pretty much lifts all restrictions for vaccinated players, while those who have not been vaccinated must abide by strict health protocols put into place during the pandemic. New Braunfels Canyon quarterback Drew Barry is hard at work getting ready for his senior season with the Cougars. He can often be found working with and learning from quarterback coach Yale Vinoy. Barry was a second team all district QB in 2020, passing for more than 600 yards with eight touchdowns and two picks and rushing for 620 yards with five more touchdowns per max preps. He tore his ACL in the final game of the regular season and is working hard this summer to return better than ever. Right now, it's a lot of uh, rehab stuff. So, I mean, I wake up in the morning and usually go to school workouts early in the morning. Then uh, we have a little bit of team meeting stuff after that. And then I head over to PT and then uh, on weekends, I get over here to Yale and I throw and just get better every single day. Last season, the Cougs won 11 and two overall and took District 12 5A1 by storm, going six and one to win a share of the district championship. Their first season in 12 5A1 was a huge success and the Cougars want more. We're looking to have a big year. Uh, took the district by storm last year, just hoping to repeat, but nothing's easy, especially when you go, ahead, you go out there and win it the first year you're in it. Just trying to repeat. We wish Drew Barry the very best as he comes back from that injury. And tomorrow night at 6, we'll check in with Alamo Heights quarterback James Sobey. Last Friday, Judson High School star softball player Keely Williams was named to the 2021 USA Softball U18 Junior Women's National Team following a two-day selection trial process held at the USA Softball Hall of Fame Complex in Oklahoma City. She's one of 18 athletes to realize that dream. She said each day during the trial process took about 12 hours of minimum and it was just go, go, go. Now she got the great news after a game when her mom Rhonda told her, but it's how her mom told her that's memorable. I think my mom found out first, um, but right after the game, she came up to me and she was like, oh, it's OK, Keely, you didn't make it. And I was like, um, OK, that's fine. And, but then she told me she did. It was it was awesome. <laughs> so do, your mom, is she a big jokester like that? Does she like to mess around with you? <laughs> oh, yeah. My, our entire family is like that. So that's why I was like, uh, maybe there's a catch to this. I don't know. We'll see in a few seconds. <laughs> Too funny. Team USA will compete in both the World Cup held from the end of August to early September in Peru and the Junior Pan Am Games in late November, early December in Colombia. Mom's got jokes. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. Best awesome. of luck to her. It's right up your alley. Yes, it is. <laughs> Thank you, Larry. You stole my line. I was going to say that, as a matter of fact. <laughs> we'll be right back. We are just about a week away from the start of a special legislative session in Austin. This comes after the governor called that session because a lot of priority bills were not addressed in the regular session that wrapped up at the end of May. To talk about that, we are joined by Scott Braddock, editor of the Quorum Report. Scott, as always, thanks for being here with us. I want to really give people an idea of what's going to be discussed mm -hmm. in this session. What topics, what issues. Mm -hmm. So talk about the start of the session and what mm -hmm. you think is going to be really the main topics? Well, the governor has indicated he's going to take these one topic at a time, and it's not going to be a repeat of what happened in 2017. You remember the only special session that Governor Abbott has presided over so far is that one a couple of years ago, actually uh, more than that, uh, in 2017, when he put 20 items on the call for a 30-day special session. That included the bathroom bill uh, and a whole lot of other controversial issues. Only about half of them passed, and the bathroom bill was not one of them. It didn't make it. Uh, this time around, the governor says he wants to tightly control the schedule, which is why I do think that they're going to get started next week on the 8th. And this could be not one, not two, but maybe three or four special sessions as we go through the rest of the year. 
Now, at the end of the regular session, the governor said that he had basically taken care of anything regarding the electric grid. There seems to be mm -hmm. some miscommunication between Abbott and the lieutenant governor. Do we expect that there'll be more about the electric grid in this special session? This is a point of disagreement between the lieutenant governor, Dan Patrick, and the governor. You may have seen there was an op-ed submitted by the lieutenant governor, Dan Patrick, in the Dallas Morning News uh, this week, where he was making the argument that there should be more done when it comes to the electricity market and the electricity grid itself in Texas. Governor Abbott has said, as you noted, Tim, that, look, uh, everything that needed to be done, uh, you know, that it got done during the regular session. That, at least that's the governor's opinion. So the governor's the guy who gets to make the call. And I think if it's a conflict between the two of them, it's not going to happen. But to further answer Myra's question, I think you're going to see uh, over the next uh, few months uh, items on the call like uh, critical race theory, which, of course, very controversial uh, in elections, quote, integrity bill. That's what Republicans call it. Uh, Democrats call it voter suppression uh, and also the targeting of transgender youth in sports and high schools across Texas. A lot of those bills uh, certainly contentious. They are uh, hot button issues. And all this is happening mm -hmm. at, at a time when the the governor vetoed the legislative budget, which essentially means that a lot of the staff involved in the legislature, they're not getting paid. So can you explain who is not getting paid right now because of that? And is this something that budget, do you think that's something that has got to be addressed during this session? An unprecedented move by the governor. This is a real encroachment uh, by the executive branch on the legislative branch. And what I mean by that is it has never happened before that the governor canceled out funding for the legislative branch and their staff, uh, which is what the governor did by vetoing Article 10 of the Texas budget, uh, which actually everybody's being paid right now. And this is where it turns into leverage. The people who may not get paid uh, coming up after September when the new budget would take effect, that would be the staffers in legislative offices, something called the Legislative Budget Board, uh, which is sort of of the accountants for the uh, for the legislature, as well as legislative council, which is their attorney. That's their attorney's office, uh, basically. And so those kinds of things need to be funded for legislating to happen, for them to actually make laws. There has been a lawsuit uh, or actually a, a filing. Uh, it's not really a lawsuit, but a filing. Democrats and some others are asking the Texas Supreme Court to void that veto by the governor so that the uh, pay for those people can continue past September. And one reason they would want to do that is, for one, um, the legislature doesn't work for Governor Abbott. They're not his employees. They're the employees of all Texans, just like Governor Abbott works for all Texans. These are equal branches of government. For him to do that, I think there's a legitimate question. It's in front of the Texas Supreme Court now. Uh, and even the all Republican, I mean, it's, uh, the entire Supreme Court in Texas is Republican justices, but they're still taking it seriously. They have asked for a response uh, you know, from Governor Abbott and his folks uh, before the special session actually starts. I don't want to get too much into the partisan politics here, but mm -hmm. some would question, why is this special session starting on July 8th, going into a weekend? You seem to have a theory about that. Well, it seems pretty clear to me. Uh, July 8th is uh, the date that this special session is set to start. The governor, of course, is the only one who can say when it starts and what topics will be addressed. Uh, the very next day uh, in Dallas, CPAC, the big conservative political uh, action conference, that starts in Dallas. Uh, and uh, you've got uh, the President Trump show. You had it today with Governor Abbott on the border with former President Trump. And uh, in Dallas, it'll be the same thing. Uh, Trump is actually the first speaker and the last speaker at CPAC. So it's all about Trump. And, you know, this whole question of addressing elections laws in Texas uh, and in other states as well, but we'll talk about Texas since that's what we do here. Um, in Texas, you have Republicans who want to, and I put it in three words, they want to avenge Trump somehow. And the fact that they haven't worked out the somehow yet, that the speaker, the governor, and the lieutenant governor, they were never on the same page during the regular session. That's why that big elections bill, Senate Bill 7, which you covered so well on KSAT, that's why it all fell apart. And the Democrats were in position to walk out at the end of the session and kill that legislation. What form it will be in, uh, you know, after this coming weekend, you know, after uh, the legislative session, special session gets going again and multiple special sessions to come, we'll see what form it takes. But it doesn't seem that the Republican leadership is on the same page still. And we're, you know, going into July now of 2021. Let's talk about that move by Democrats at the end of the mm -hmm. regular session. They staged that walkout as part of a strategy to avoid talking about a, a bill that that Democrats largely did not believe in. Now they're being brought mm -hmm. back to discuss uh, likely that very issue. So in your mind, do you think we're going to see any of this political strategizing in some of these big moves the way we saw at the end of the regular session? 
Myra, it's a great question. I would love to be a fly on the wall when the Democrats are meeting privately about what they're going to do. Are they actually going to show up in Austin for this special session when one topic after another is probably going to come from the governor that they don't agree with, uh, even addressing? Uh, but back to the question of what form this elections bill should be in. Look, we didn't even know until the last 72 hours of session what that bill was going to look like. It included things like uh, cracking down on what they call souls to the polls in the uh, African-American community when they go early vote on Sundays. It also included a provision that would make it easier for judges to overturn elections with little to no evidence at all. And you had Republicans throwing each other under the bus after the session was over and saying they weren't even sure how that language got into the bill. And I think it comes back to this question. What is that bill supposed to look like 10 years ago in 2011 when voter ID was passed by the Texas legislature? It was a very straightforward proposal. It was bitterly partisan and it was hotly contested and debated, but everybody knew what we were talking about. And like I say, we're going into July here in 2021 and we still don't know from Republican leadership, from the governor, lieutenant governor or the speaker, what they want that elections bill to look like. Huge question. The speaker has said instead of a huge bill, he'd like to see smaller bills that address maybe one or two pieces of Texas election law rather than trying to tackle the whole thing. He thinks that might be a better way to do it. We'll see what form this all takes uh, mm -hmm. in just about a week when the special session starts on July 8th. Scott Braddock with the Quorum Report. Thanks for being here. Always great to be with you. Thank you. And we'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Taking a look at I-10 East at Loop 1604. We'll have another construction-related closure here this evening. You can kind of see the equipment there. They're going to close this interchange because they're working here on the bridge. So the traffic's going to be diverted to the frontage road. Just to give you a look at where that is. Uh, right here, 1604 and I-10 East. We had some delays here yesterday. Not seeing those today. Closure through 5 a.m. tomorrow morning kicks off at 9. Looking at other parts of the area, still have some issues here and there. We'll start here in the Braunfels area. Some major backups on 35. So if you're heading north, maybe towards San Marcos or Austin this evening, you're going to run into some delays. Also some delays on 35 heading down into San Antonio. We're also watching this situation. I-10 at Woodlawn crash still on the board. Some major delays. We'll take another look here at Trans Guide. I'm going to do that here and take a look here. You can still see the traffic heading outbound away from downtown. Some major delays this evening. So watch out for that and we'll keep an eye on things this evening. Tim and Meyer. Thank you, Samuel. Look outside with live cam, more clouds, more sun, more rain for some. Kind of have a, a nice mix going these last couple days, Adam. Oh, it's been a fantastic mix. We've had some good maintenance rain, not just here, but all across the state of Texas. And it's good, especially for late June, to be having this as we go into July. And we're actually going to see more of it in the days ahead. This evening, though, 8 o'clock, a 10 to 20 percent chance of a few showers. What we have out there is mostly coming to an end. A few rogue downpours left over. As the sun sets, most of this is going to simmer down and basically be gone. We'll talk about the chances for the next couple of days, along with 4th of July and what you you should plan around coming right up. Lady Liberty is getting a visit from her little sister. A second Statue of Liberty arrived at New York City Harbor earlier today. The smaller statue only nine feet tall and weighs 1,000 pounds, much smaller, of course, than the original. A crew of French officers followed the same path of the original one to deliver it from Marseille to New York. It is a gift from France and will first go on display on Ellis Island. The statue then heads to Washington, D.C., where it will be on display for the next 10 years. It's pretty neat. Mm -hmm. All right, so the weather out there today, it's been nice. It's just been pleasant yes. for this time of year. Wondering, of course, how long that's going to last, Adam. <laughs> yes. Well, it, this has been a very good pattern, very, uh, very conducive to keeping our drought away from us, keeping us out of drought, giving us some good rain. It is going to fluctuate, though, a little bit over the next couple of days and then even impact your 4th of July. So let's talk about it here. Taking a look at the rainfall since Sunday. Everywhere you see a color on the map, we've had rain. I know uh, west along the Rio Grande, we really haven't had a whole lot. But elsewhere, we've at least had some good areas of rainfall and some pockets of heavy rain. I mean, you get just basically southeast of Floresville over four inches where you see the yellow on the map, the yellow, orange and red that indicates basically between two and four inches of rainfall estimated by the radar. 
A lot of these are backed up by rain gauge measurements as well. Uh, Lake Hills area up toward Bandera Pike Pipe Creek over three inches since Sunday. A lot of that was yesterday. You look at the action now uh, down south of town, southwest of town over the past couple of hours. Carrizo Springs got hit by a little downpour there, a little bit of lightning and thunder, but look how quickly dissipated two hours here flares up and then gone. These are brief and this has been the trend for the past couple of days. The routine is the same this evening. Notice over a two hour period how all that activity on the radar screen just settles down as the sun gets lower in the sky. We lose the daytime heating. We lose these showers as well. Even the ones we've had from Schulenburg to Hallettsville toward Moulton. Shiner, look at that, just skipping around Shiner, but giving Shiner a nice cool outflow, a nice little cool breeze from those thunderstorms. Locally, nothing popping up around town right now. We had some earlier today, and that should be it for the rest of the night. So let's talk about our overall weather pattern here. You see the wide, widely separated showers and downpours through the day today. Short lived. They have a hard time really sustaining themselves. These aren't the severe types of thunderstorms. This is just garden variety splash and dash. Upper level high pressure system is over Dallas. That upper level high is going to be settling in over the next couple of days. That's going to press down on us a little bit. And as it does that, I think it's going to keep us generally dry and rain free. Also, temperatures will rise a little bit, especially because we won't have as much cloud cover. I mean, we've seen the cooler temperatures largely because of some outflow boundaries and rain cooled air and extensive cloud cover. This is Thursday and Friday, lower rain chances, but into Sunday, that upper level ridge breaks down and moves out of here. So by Saturday, even on into the 4th of July, it's back to this pattern of afternoon pop up downpours random in nature. So the coverage will be about 40% of South Texas Saturday through early next week. So of course that includes 4th of July. When making your 4th of July plans, just keep in mind these are only brief downpours. There's minimal lightning. They're not severe and they're typically all done around or even a little before sunset. So fireworks time should be OK. 91 degrees was our high at the airport today. That was right before a little shower moved in and we had uh, temperatures drop down as a result. Right now we're at 83. Dew point is 73. Of course, we've got the typical humidity in the air. Bandera is now 76. Canyon Lake at 79. You can tell where it has rained and where they've had some outflow boundaries because temperatures are a little bit lower than you'd expect. Carrizo Springs 79 right now. So often this time of year, we're talking triple digits south and west of town. Catula's 82 degrees. That's what this pattern does. Tomorrow morning, most of us low to mid 70s. By the afternoon, I think we'll make it into the low to mid 90s. So we're talking 92 Eagle Pass, 96 Del Rio, 91 Gonzales and Canyon Lake. Get to Lavernia about 91, downtown San Antonio 92 and Bernie 89. A lot of sunshine tomorrow. Just that 10% chance, so that off chance of a stray shower. A lot of sunshine, low to mid 90s the next couple of days. However, we'll have the extra clouds to tame the temperatures a bit to near 90 this weekend with those Widely separated, random splash and dash tropical downpours this weekend into next week. All right, thanks, Adam. In case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's In Case You Missed It. And good morning. It is Wednesday. It is June 30th. Murder suspect turned himself into the Atascosa County Sheriff's Office. 63-year-old Jimmy Garcep indicted by a grand jury this month. He was wanted in connection with a deadly shooting near Highway 16 in Poteet. Newly alarming numbers from the CDC. The highly contagious Delta variant now accounts for more than 26% of new cases in the U.S. In parts of the Mid and Mountain West, the CDC estimates it could account for more than 50% of new cases. The Delta variant now in all 50 states. Missouri being hit the hardest. San Antonio police are also looking for the man responsible for shooting someone and stealing their bike. It happened last night around 11 o'clock on South General McMullen Drive. That is near West Commerce and Castroville Road. Officers at the scene say when they arrived, they found a man with a gunshot wound to his back. Witnesses told police the suspect knocked the man to the ground and then shot him. He then stole the victim's bike and rode down San Fernando Street. The suspect has not yet been found. The victim taken to University Hospital. He is, is, is expected to survive. Former Department of Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld has died at the age of 88. According to a statement from his family, Rumsfeld was surrounded by his loved ones at the time of his death. The Chicago native served in the Navy as a fighter pilot from 1954 to 1957. 
He made history becoming the youngest defense secretary under President Gerald Ford. In 2001, Rumsfeld held that role again during the George W. Bush administration. The cause of his death has not yet been released. <laughs>One final traffic update this evening. Things getting better across most of the area, but there are a few hot spots here and there. This is a Joint Base San Antonio Randolph. Some delays there on 1604. You're down to 10 miles per hour there near Universal City Boulevard. Also, still some major delays on 35 if you're heading north of New Braunfels. So if you're heading to San Marcos, Ross this, is, this evening, watch out for that down to 8 miles per hour. Also, some delays on 35 southbound heading into San Antonio. So it'll take you 35 minutes to get from New Braunfels right. to Loop 410 in town. So watch out for that. Also, looking at this crash, still westbound on I-10 at Woodlawn. Still some delays. You can see that there on Transguide, the I-10 and Frio view getting a little bit better at them. All righty, looking at our forecast next couple of days, mainly just more sunshine than what we've had in the afternoon. So a little bit warmer, low to mid 90s and generally dry. We get into the weekend, we fall back into this pattern that we've been in, which is great if you ask me, with some daily pop up random downpours, some good maintenance rain here and there. Non severe activity, usually pretty brief, little to no lightning with most of it. And that's going to be the case through the 4th of July and even into early next week. But planning 4th of July fireworks should be OK. I'm liking this pattern too. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the news at six. See you back here for the night beat tonight at 10. Until then, have a good evening.